I'd like to take this opportunity to present, to introduce the next speaker, Errol Smart, Managing Director and CEO of Orion Minerals Limited. Errol is a geologist with 30 years of industry experience across all aspects of exploration, mine development, and operations in precious and base metals. He has held positions in Anglo Gold, Claf Mining, Metal and Gold, Clarity Minerals, Lion Gold Corporation, and African Stellar Group. Errol's senior executive roles have been on several boards of companies listed on both the TSX and ASX, and he currently serves as chairman of the Junior Mining Leadership Forum of the Minerals Council of South Africa, and is also a director on the board of the, base board of the Minerals Council of South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome Mr. Errol to the podium. Just get this up after the short person was at the mics. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Um, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm a disruptor. I'm also the joker on the stage. So don't take everything that I say at face value. Um, and I think I was sitting here on the stage and, and reflecting on what the opportunity is today. And I wanted to come up here and tell a very positive story about South Africa and the minerals potential and what's happening in South Africa. And it is something that I really believe in. I think there's incredible minerals potential and there's a lot happening in South Africa. There's a lot of things that make me angry. There's a lot of things that make me very positive. And South Africa has got the opportunity to go through major change, major change, that could completely change the investment landscape going forward. Now, uh, wearing my joker hat, Mr. Mabuza, are you listening to me now? Nah, <laughs> you knew this was coming. So, if I'm gonna be on this stage today and the opportunity has been created as it has, and our shop steward of the mining industry isn't here because normally he would bully me, so the Minister of Mines isn't in the room today, no. And uh, in Africa, we like a palace coup. So for a day, maybe I think it's time to have a palace coup. And um, maybe I'll give the speech that I was hoping the Minister was going to give earlier on today. So maybe all those that present and voting, vote for Errol Smart as, as Minister of Mines for the day. <laughs> Guys, jokes aside, there's a lot of things that can change in South Africa to make a huge positive impact. South Africa is a great place. We have got great minerals. It isn't unplayable. Don't believe that disenfranchised, unhappy, ex-South African neighbor of yours that's living in Mandara. It isn't impossible to live there. A lot of us live there because we love it and we want to live there and there's good quality people and there's mining businesses that make good money in South Africa, and there will be more of them. South Africa is starting to recognize the challenge and starting to react to it. We see that business is stepping in to a vacuum. One of my DMRE colleagues was explaining earlier today, there isn't a vacuum. Somebody steps in and takes leadership. But we do see in South Africa that the regulator, the government, and industry are starting to walk hand in hand. And it's not going to change everything overnight. Things are going to take a little bit of time to change because there's a lot to fix. Let's be serious. There's a lot to fix, but it is going to get fixed. And the upside is enormous. And that's what we've got to be focused on. We've got to stop crying over the missed opportunity and look at this great opportunity that's going to emerge from it. Because the minerals are in the ground, the people are good, and there's a lot that can be done. And we're in a very interesting space in the mineral economy in the world. And it's the right time for South Africa to step forward again and grow. We look at Perth that has been built on a mining economy. You know, and I look at Perth now and I see Johannesburg 100 years ago. And we'll get back there again. But for South Africans, we've all got to start pulling in the same direction and stop complaining. I am in South Africa because... At least 80% of the time, I do have grid power. And it is cheaper than the power that anybody on any mine in Australia is using. 
I do drive to my mine on a tar road. I do have a whole lot of things, power, water, all sorts of things on the mine sites when we go there. So yes, it's not as good as it is and it's not as good as it has been. But it can get a lot better and I believe it's going to get a lot better and there is a huge opportunity because it's a brownfields mining site. The whole of South Africa is a brownfields mining site and it's ready for redevelopment and Iran has moved from Australia to South Africa because it is a great opportunity and we are first movers we are taking a first mover advantage and we're busy developing a criti critical minerals industry. Now, I left a disclaimer up there while I was talking because please don't believe a word of what I said. Go do your own research. All right, so what is Orion doing now that I've chewed up most of my presentation time? We went into a situation that we had a broad vision. We had a moral compass when we went back to South Africa. I'd been working around the planet for 20 years, and I invested, I got convinced a bunch of Australian investors to back us to go back into South Africa because there was this emerging need for future-facing metals. That wasn't a term when we started doing it. Critical metals wasn't a term. But we said that there is an emerging trend. The world is going to need a certain suite of minerals, and let's position ourselves. And let's not just position to get the minerals. Let's position ourselves to be a supplier to an end user, an end user that has to have certain obligations fulfilled, otherwise they will not take your metals. So we created this value chain. So from the time that we went there and we started doing exploration, before we ever drilled the first hole, we had the first community meetings. We went there and we started trying to create an environment that was ultimately going to be conducive to pr produce these metals. Over the seven years that we've been busy in South Africa, and, and it's been six years since we got our first licenses in South Africa, we've grown and we've seen what's happening globally. And now we're steadily moving into development, into mining, we're looking at beneficiation, we're looking at all the peripheral issues and the opportunities that are presented. How do you do your water management? How do you do your power management? How do you work with the stakeholders? How do you produce fertilizer from the water that you pump out the mine? What do you do with the water that you pump from a mine? These are opportunities. If we can get that e circular economy working in South Africa, we can feed a very important part of the industry. And South Africa really does lend itself to do that. So we are a dual listed company. We are listed on the ASX and the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. The shares are freely fungible. Our history was we started with Australian investors, individuals that were prepared to take the punt and go to South Africa. When South Africans weren't prepared to do it, I couldn't find money to do exploration in South Africa. You know, Brad has built a mining company because there were South Africans that saw an opportunity and they couldn't find money in South Africa to do it. And the money came from here. Yeah, it came from Australia. So Australians are risk investors, and there's a, a connection there that I'd be sad to see lost. And that's why between South Africa and South Africa, Australia and South Africa, there's a commonality, and there's value being turned. Investments that were made from here are turning money for Australian investors. The South Africans that rode on the back of it and saw the opportunity, now we're getting Austra South African investors in because we've largely de-risked the project. Now we're busy building mines and going forward. And we will also be cash flow positive in two years' time and all these wonderful dreams. That's where we want to be. But the original risk investment came from Australia and we couldn't find that money in South Africa. Funny enough, now we can't find the money in Australia to take it to the next step. All the money is coming from South Africa and from Europe. Um, you guys can go on our website and see all these fancy numbers in the presentation. I'm not going to take you through all of it. Three major shareholders, um, Tembo Capital, a private equity fund, um, European private equity fund managed jointly out of London and out of Brisbane, uh, the Delphi Group, or German shareholders, uh, German private equity funds, 
Um, recently, in May this year, we brought in Clover Alloys, South African and British investors operating out of South Africa and running a very successful chrome and, and platinum mining business in South Africa. And that's what's taken us a step forward. We found an alternative way to finance mines in South Africa and the right money to do it. And that's what it's about. It's about partnerships, building these partnerships. As much as I, I beat up on the DMRE, and my colleagues here know that when I get on the stage, the DMRE is going to get beaten. They get beaten because I want it to be better. Not because it's unplayable, but if it was any better, we could have done so much more. And we will do more because the colleagues of the DMRE do listen to us, and we do work with them and with the Minerals Council under Zila's leadership now. There's a lot of arm wrestling that goes on, but we're starting to find a common path. We work on strategy documents. We're starting to get plans together that can take our mineral industry forward, and it is successful. So, yes, because I'm Minister of Mines for the day, there should be a mineral cadastre announced by the end of today. Um, no, I don't think it's going to happen. But at least I do know that I can go sit and make a pest of myself in the DMRE office in Kimberley, and eventually it will be dealt with and I will get my mineral title. And we do have got a functional court system in South Africa, so if my mineral title is given to the wrong person, I can take it to court and I can get it back. That's something that you can't do in a lot of places in the world. So there are positive things that we've got to work on. But this Northern Cape of South Africa is an absolute smorgasbord of minerals. It is absolutely resplendent with all the critical metals. So for first movers like ourselves, we were focused on copper, we were focused on zinc, we were focused on nickel. But on our properties at the moment, we've prob probably got every single one of the critical metals and a couple of ones that people haven't even thought of yet that are going to be critical. Things like indium that nobody even thinks about, but your cell phone doesn't work without indium, and South Africa is actually one of the biggest producers of indium because indium is a byproduct of zinc. So there's interesting things happening in this world, and we're very aware of them. Our largest operation, Presco, this is where we went in 2017, an old Anglo Vol mine. Anglo Vol was one of those big South African mining houses. They mined the easy, easy ore. It got difficult in the mid-80s, and they made a decision not to recapitalize the mine, rather they shut the mine and it lay dormant. We spotted an opportunity, and it's an absolute gem. We've drilled up 30 million tons of jork resources there now. If anybody asks me where I believe it'll end, you know, somewhere double that is where this thing is going to end. We've done a bankable feasibility study on it. The challenge for Orion was funding a big number feasibility study like this is a challenge in South Africa. We had to do innovative financing, but we found a way to do it. And that's the thing about South Africa is we're resilient. We find a way to do something. We don't take no for an answer. So this is a long section and a cross section of the ore body. Um, on the left-hand side, as I said, there's a steeply dipping ore body that was mined by the Anglo Vol Group until 1991. At the bottom of the ore body, in the bottom of the syncline there, you see that there's a fat, long section, a big uh, uh, a horseshoe of ore sitting at the bottom there. That's where we've got 28 million tons. We've got total, including the, the ore that's remaining above the water, we've got 31 million tons of jork resource. We were struggling to finance this as a big ticket item to go raise $450 million to build this mine. We've now found another way to do it. We're actually going to start small to grow big. We've just signed the mining contract, which we announced yesterday. The mining contractors are busy moving on site. We've prepared the site, and we'll be drilling and blasting, and there will be ore on surface. Um, the minister has sold me he's coming to open our mine on the 27th of October. So I'm hoping to see him there. And because he spent nine years of his life here building the National Union of Mine Workers, he lived on this site. So there's a connection with the man, and it's part of the where we've got to go to in the future, is a changed way of mining. This will be 
very mechanized, very modern, very efficient mining operation. It won't put people in harm's way. The intention is not to have hand one labor on mine face. It's a mechanized, automated, modern mining operation. So we've overcome the challenges. You know, we found the money, we found a way to get the water out of the mine, and we found a way to early cash flow. We found the investors that are going to back us to do this. So it's partnerships that you've got to build. You know, Africa is about partnerships. You've got to have people that you can walk a very difficult pathway with because there's spugupus on the way. You've got to know that there's going to be trouble on the way. You need partners that are going to be with you when you get to the end. So we've got a whole revised project strategy there. Um, we're starting with early dewatering. Instead of trying to pump all the water in the world out of the mine in two years, we're going to do it over three and a half years. Exponential cost is reduced. Big savings there. Get into production early. We're going to have all on, all on surface in a month's time. We're busy working with people that are looking at putting a build and operate plant on, on the site. So we could have a plant technically on the site this time next year. Let's hope so. I'd be very proud to stand here next year and say we've sold our first concentrates. It's a way of building the mine, and this will grow into a very significant producer, 22,000 tons a year of copper, 60,000 tons a year of zinc. So you're speaking about 32, 33,000 tons a year of copper equivalent. This is a very significant producer. It's a very significant value chain in this mine. And this, together with our Oki project that I'm going to take you through in a moment, that will give us another 9,000 tons a year of copper production five years from now. These are the studies that have been published. So, you know, we, we're getting up into the upper 40,000 tons a year of copper production. You know, you, I was, watched Sandfire early on. Fantastic operation. Done great things. They're going to be producing 50,000 tons. So we are significant. And this is in South Africa. It's on the other side of the border. And I hope that very shortly South Africa will be taking the leadership role here at ADU again and actually showing how it can be done and how it will be done in the future in South Africa. Um, we have raised now, got $147 million uh, Aussie dollars raised and secured for the Prisca mine development. We've just run, raised $13 million of cash and we have share options in the money, currently sitting at 30% in the money, um, $60 million worth of share options. So we feel that we can touch and feel about $220 million. We've only got a market cap of 115. So speak about punching above your weight. That's what we had to do. We had to find a way of going around in a circular way and getting the financing done for this mine, and that's what we've been able to achieve. While we've been doing this, we've realized there's much bigger opportunities in South Africa, and we mustn't stop. We've got to. We've actually managed to get a first mover advantage. We've learned to understand how to do this in South Africa. We've, we've learned which doors you've got to knock on and where you've got to beg and where you've got to cry, but there's a way to get these things done. So we saw the next opportunity as the um, Springbok um, Okip Copper District. It's a district that's produced uh, nearly 2 million tons of copper. At the moment, there's one small copper producer that's operating there. We moved in. It was a completely fragmented mineral title area. I think we've bought about seven different companies to achieve what we've done. There's about 25 different mineral rights that had to be acquired, modifications to mineral rights. We just announced another bunch of them on Monday. But we're getting very close now. Now, the reason why we went there is this district was operated by Newmont and Goldfields in the past. It didn't shut down because the ore was mined out. It shut down at a time when there was a very low real-term copper price, and things weren't going great in South Africa at the time. The owners at the time decided not to recapitalize the mine. They shut the smelter. This place had its own dedicated smelter. They shut the smelter, and that basically left the mines orphaned. Fantastic opportunity for us. There was more than 70 million tons of ore remaining on the books that hasn't been mined. It's not your compliant. 
because it predates chalk. But we've gone in there and we've drilled up the first block and we've drilled already 12 million tons that we've converted to jaw compliance with a very high success rate. This is a place where, again, brownfield site, we can fast track it and we can become a very serious producer here. This camp, this copper camp, used to produce between, it started at about 15,000 tons per annum, but it got up to four, over 40,000 tons per annum of <coughs> copper production. That's what our aspiration is here. This is what we think we can do in this district again. And we believe we can do it again for four or five decades. This is a long life asset group and we, we're really getting good value out of this. This is a cluster, all those little dots that you see in there, those, that Smarty Pack, M&M &M Pack, sorry, that you see over there, those are the deposits. The green ground and the red ground in the center there are on our rights, or our rights under application. And I won't beat up on the DMROE about how long it takes to get an application done, but we're getting there. We're getting there, guys. It just takes a little while, but we're getting there. And I'm very pleased that it's moving faster than what it used to. So we're getting over the hurdles, we're getting the ground, we've just finished the feasibility study. That's the history of the, the production of the, of the area under the different owners. And you see when the mine closed, it was in the lowest real-time copper price that had ever been seen. Look where the copper price is now and where it's predicted to go back to. These are real terms prices. When copper goes back to the prices that have been predicted now, we'll be doing what Newmont were doing and making a lot of money. That's what we want to be there for. So I'll just skip forward very quickly through this. It's available or you can drive down that portal 100 meters below surface, there's stopes that are drilled and ready to be charged and blasted. This is very quick and easy into production, and that's why we're there. And then we've got other exciting things that we work on in the side. We've got a massive nickel, copper, cobalt uh, PGE deposit, just 65 kilometers to the north of Prisco. This ground, for those of you that are Aussies, will know the Fraser Range in WA. This is the geological twin for the Fraser Range. In the Fraser Range, the big discoveries that were made were via uh, nickel, copper, cobalt discoveries. In this case, in the Oriachup in South Africa, they actually discovered the uh, VMS deposits first. But when I went over there and I'd been working here on the Fraser Range, I looked at the rocks and I said, but this is identical. We're going to find the nickel. And we went and we mined the history. And Mabuza will know, having the data is brilliant because if you can get the historic data, there's a whole lot of mining that gets done before you ever break ground. So we've mined data and we've been able to pull the information together of work that was done by Anglo-American in the 1970s. And we've managed to get it up to a jaw compliant resource there of nearly 70 million tons. We've only drilled one seventh of the ore body. It's a massive nickel, copper, cobalt, PGE deposit. And then on this property, you know, I spoke about the smorgasbord of minerals. This is Mercedes-Benz's critical minerals list. They're one of the um, EV companies that we speak to because the world is changing. You don't just sell to smelters anymore. You smell to it, sell to an end user. They're looking for these minerals. They're looking for these minerals. No, it's not them alone, BMW, Toyota, Volkswagen, the whole lot of them are looking for these minerals. They're looking for suppliers that can give them the full supply chain. There's very few places in the world where all of the minerals lie on one mineral right. These are our minerals on one mineral right, that we've got one mining right that we have. Great opportunity here. There's a whole lot of work to be done once I've got all my prospecting rights and section 102s and section 11s, but we're busy working on it in good faith. This is something that's going to be, turn into something very important. So we've discovered high-grade nickel here, something that we'll continue working on. We love it, but we think that there's a much bigger opportunity because we've gone and looked at technologies around the world. This whole Northern Cape is a desert area. Water is a problem. You don't want to do environmentally unsound things. You, acid leaching is going to be a challenge. 
So we went and looked at metal vapor, vapor, metal vapor refining, basically doing stuff dry, using chlorine gas and using carbonyl gas. Between the two gases, and these are known processes that are used in known refineries around the world, some of them here in Australia. Iluka uses some of this stuff. The same technologies that are avail available around the world can be done on smaller scale, and we've got a team working on it, and we're coming up with fantastic solutions on lab scale. We'll be talking about that more later in the year. But this is where the opportunity is going for miners and junior miners in particular. Don't do what everybody's done before. Don't just feed the off-takers and the smelters. Let's produce the end products. Let's produce them in South Africa so that we stimulate the gigafactories, we stimulate the, the Mercedes of the world, the Volkswagen of the world, to keep producing their EVs in South Africa. It can be done. It's a dream, but we all need a dream to chase. Thank you very much.